now. On 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 806 now. It's O'Connor and Company. We're fired up to finish this 24th hour of radio that we do every single week. Four hours every morning. If you missed any of it, please subscribe to our podcast. You can download the show. Uh, I'll never forget uh, Patrice Anwuka, Barack Obama, just a few days ago, lecturing the American people as he always does. But it was one of the most hypocritical things I've ever heard. Listen. I, I don't understand how we got so toxic and just so divided and so bitter. And I, I, I get why sometimes people just don't want to pay attention to it. The lack of self-awareness from really? this man lamenting how divided we are can say, you know, I, I lived through his presidency and the tactics that were yes. employed there. Um, but, Patrice, he does speak to something. Though, listen, Obama has a very good sense of what the American people are, are feeling and sensing and concerned about. And it is mm-hmm. true. I think, you know, when people say we're exhausted, we're fatigued, but we are because yeah. so many of us have been through the ringer because of the toxic nature of political debates and discussions in this country accentuated by social media and if you are on the wrong side you'll be canceled you'll be destroyed you 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 know it's it's so ugly and so bad and if that's the case and if people are feeling that i want you to take just a moment or two and listen to senator jd vance of ohio last night appearing at a town hall set up by news nation network hosted by chris cuomo I want let's just start with this clip right here of cut 26 Um, to me. The biggest threat to democracy is the rising tide of censorship. The idea that we should be trying to silence our fellow Americans rather than persuade them and talk to them. That's always going to that's always going to lead to people being off because they don't like to be told what to think or what to say. They like to talk to one another. And that's one thing that I'll always commit to as, as you know, your vice president for, for the next four years, I'll always try to talk to people. We'll go out there and we'll do events with people who disagree with us. We'll answer questions from people who don't always see eye to eye. But I think if we set the tone at the top, the leadership of this country is all about communicating with one another. I think that's how we start to heal the divide. But we all have a role in it. And and one, one final point I'll, I'll say about this. And You know, don't get too personal all the time, but, you know, one of the things I've seen, especially from, you know, some of my my wife's friends and some of my friends is that they disagree with us on politics sometimes. They'll get very personal about it. And, And if you're discarding a lifelong friendship because somebody votes for the other team, then you've made a terrible, terrible mistake and you should do something different. Like, don't don't cast aside. Like most of my family, obviously, is going to vote for you know Donald Trump and J.D. Vance, and if they, they they're not, actually, I need to talk to them. Um, but but I've got friends who like me personally, acquaintances who aren't necessarily going to vote for me. That doesn't make them bad people. And you can't. We can't. This is my my most important advice. Whether you vote for me, whether you vote for 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 Donald Trump, whether you vote for Kamala Harris, don't cast aside family members and lifelong friendships. Politics is not worth it. And I think if we follow that principle, we'll heal the divide in this country. Thank you, <laughs> man. I got to tell you, really good. It's really so good. good and so important and an important yes. message. And by the way, if Barack Obama really worries about the divisive nature of this country, he could use his platform, use his popularity, use his gravitas, what's there of it, and say something like that. You never mm. hear him say that. What you hear from Obama is, you know, people disagree with you, get in their face and argue with them and try to convince them and control them. And he could, it, And instead of saying, listen, we're not always going to agree, but that doesn't mean that the person who disagrees with you is your enemy. And that's man, it's and and it's been such an ugly, destructive trend in this country that's been accentuated over the last 10 years. And if this is a moment where J.D. Vance and his voice and hopefully I believe Donald Trump as well can help move this as part of the conversation and politics and and interpersonal Mm. relationships, that would so so far to shifting this country from where it's been. Uh, I, I hope that it's a trend. I hope it takes on. I hope I so, really, too. I certainly feel with Joe Biden's presidency and a potential mm-hmm. Kamala Harris presidency, things will only get worse. 
You know, what's interesting is um, Kamala Harris always talks about uh, this being about Trump, Trump running for office, as though when Trump, when President Trump became president, that suddenly uh, all of the divisiveness emerged out of nowhere. When in yeah. fact, what I think you saw is a lot of dissatisfaction, people who've, who've suppressed their and censored, self-censored, um, suppressed their own view, feelings and viewpoints just so that they could get along to go along or because they didn't have an advocate with a strong, powerful platform to be able to represent them. President yeah. Trump came along and turned over the apple cart and, and suddenly he gave voice to people who felt voiceless. Now what you have are so many supporters of the president, supporters of for America First, whatever you want to call it, who feel emboldened to speak. And I think it, it, it freaks out the left because they're not they're used to the suppression of conservative or of, uh, of different opinions of their own. Yeah. And they yeah. can't stand it now that they have to actually compare policy to policy That's to go right. up against somebody who they like but thinks differently from them and that exposes their own intolerance which they themselves can't even deal with yeah and and the rules used to be oh you can go ahead and have your personal political beliefs but keep keep them to yourself keep it to yourself if you're a conservative yes. and now and now those rules have changed and and yeah. so their reaction is we will cancel you a little bit more from Vance here because mm. it, that that really stuck out to me and I thought it was hugely important to hear he also drilled down on some great policy discussions. This first one I'm going to play with you. This is somebody in the crowd who said, you know, I'm, I'm a veteran of the Army. I, and, well, I'll let you hear it. All right. I support this president's Middle East policy and your Middle East policy and the sure. past Abraham Accords. A little bit concerned with your Ukrainian policy. Understood. But you are going to inherit a $37 trillion debt when you come into office. Mm -hmm. How do we maintain that debt, debt payments, in our national security for ourselves, for our national security, and for our allies? Yeah. By the way, and I'm, I'm going to let you hear the answer here, but I, it also struck me as I watched this, uh, this is a town hall, and this is mm -hmm. News Nation, this, this upstart sort of, you know, fledgling streaming news uh, network or cable network. Chris Cuomo yes. has a show there, so does Leland Vittert and some other people. This was probably the most intelligent town hall I've ever heard in terms of the questions really? that are being asked. I could okay. tell that these were not screened and written by producers. When mm -hmm. CNN does a town hall, I still feel like the questions are all coming from the same four people who write the questions for the news anchors yeah. on those shows. Uh, that was a great question. You know, I support some of your power and policy. I mm -hmm. disagree with some of it. But the bigger question is, how in the hell are you going to execute anything when you've got all this debt? That's a yeah. question no one has asked this entire election cycle. Here's Vance's answer. Uh, very, very good question, and I, I appreciate that you don't always agree with us on everything. Hopefully, uh, we can have a reasonable conversation here because I think that's what the, the country really needs. And I appreciate your question. I appreciate the spirit in which you asked it most of all. I, I think on the debt in particular, look, there are three big reasons why we have a sky-high debt. And you'll forgive me maybe for getting into the weeds a little bit here, but if you go back to 2019, the federal government spent $4.4 trillion. And now in 2024, we'll probably spend about $6.8 trillion. Now you ask yourself, okay, that's $2.4 trillion in a very short period of time. The big thing that happened is that all the emergency spending that we did during the COVID pandemic to prevent people from losing their jobs and losing their business, this was important stuff. We made that spending permanent under Kamala Harris and Joe Biden, and that's why the debt is so sky high. That $2.4 trillion, most of that is, is hangover from 2020 and 2021. We're not in the emergency, right? Thank God, we're not in the pandemic times anymore. So let's get federal spending back to a reasonable level. That's the first thing that we ought to do to tackle the debt. All right, now there, there's more from this town hall with J.D. Vance, and you're going to hear it coming up. But that right there, nobody says that. Nobody has acknowledged. Yeah that that all of the, that everyone said well i don't like government spending but yes of course we need emergency to help people get back on their feet it's permanent it's mm. still there and anytime somebody says hey let what jd vance just said which is let's get back to normal spending and only spending uh -huh. what we need instead of there you're cutting you're cutting all this money mm -hmm. of course we're cutting it we don't need it anymore yeah but but yeah. that's that's how this debate goes. So, I mean, hopefully that's what, where the leadership takes us. I know you have an opinion about that, too, <laughs> Patrice. So I'll let you chime in in a second and more from this town hall. But I'm so I'm so impressed by. Mm -hmm. Well, let me just say the two campaigns are putting out two different closing messages for the American voter. One of them is really deep, really policy driven kind of inspiring and uh, intelligent and respects the voters. The other one is Beyonce shaking her butt. 
Bruce Springsteen screaming like a dead cat, and, oh, by the way, Donald Trump is Hitler. I'm not saying which one will work. I know which one I want to work. 815. Traffic and weather, brought to you by Hadid Carpet Cleaning. This is my, my most important advice, whether you vote for me, whether you vote for, for, for Donald Trump, whether you vote for Kamala Harris, don't cast aside family members and lifelong friendships. Politics is not worth it. And I think if we follow that principle, we'll heal the divide in this country. Thank you, man. Man, Patrice, I, I want mm. Kamala Harris to say that. I want Barack Obama to say that. I want Donald I want every candidate to say that. They won't. They won't. They no, want they this won't. to be a blood sport. But they need if, they need that dif- dif- yeah. difference between them. I mean, just to go back to what J.D. Vance was talking about with the government spending, I yes. think that's actually a really interesting point. And I just went to Cato um, and a congressional budget office to look at it, and he's 100 percent right. The new the growth in new federal spending um, is not just entitlements. We know entitlements is a whole massive beast within itself, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. But what he's talking about is all the the, the non-discretionary, no, uh, non-defense spending. It's the stuff, the welfare payments. It's veterans. It's foods. It's health care, health tax credits, welfare, school feeding, school uh, school food programs. All of that was. Hot, so, supercharged during the pandemic, maybe understandably, but why hasn't it receded? And why? Because you have an administration that has every desire and need to ensure <laughs> that you get as many people onto government aid as possible rather than getting reducing government aid. They think That's that right. success is a measure of how many people get a government check, wh- whereas success should be how many people are actually independent and can afford right. groceries for themselves and can afford to pack their own kids school lunch because uh, because inflation hasn't eaten away and, and high prices aren't eating away at their family budgets. That's uh, so, so, really so well put. Point. That's so well put. The left in this country looks at success at the federal level as how many people are getting benefits from the government. Uh, conservatives look at it as how many of, of the American people don't need to get a benefit from the mm. American government and that they're never going to f- fix that divide. Cut 27 here. Vance is asked about the foreign policy and the prospect of our military entanglement in new wars. Take a listen. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a student at the University of Michigan and a undecided voter. And I wanted to ask what the practical steps that your administration plans to take to end the war in Ukraine are. Yeah, th- thanks, Mike. I-, I appreciate that question. And, and look, I, I, um, you're obviously a student at the University of Michigan. I think that your generation should care especially a lot about this, because if we don't get this right, then we know that when the world gets set on fire, and unfortunately it's gotten very tumultuous under Kamala Harris's leadership, it's young men and young women from America who have to go overseas to pick up the pieces. And so one of the biggest and most important arguments I can make for Donald Trump is I really believe that he is the candidate of peace. And so let me, let me say two things about this. The first and most important thing, the best way to stop a war is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And if you notice, when Donald Trump was president, we didn't have any new wars. For the first time in 20 years, you had four years where there were no new wars started. And the reason is that Donald Trump followed a very simple principle of peace through strength. To be more direct, people were afraid of him. They were afraid that if they did something crazy, Donald Trump would respond to it. And so the bad actors all across the world, whether in Russia or North Korea, they were more in check when Donald Trump was president. I love the way he puts Mm. that. The bottom line is we didn't have any conflicts because other countries were afraid of Donald Trump. And I'm fine with that. I'm fine with other countries fearing us. Absolutely. Um, I want to move on to this because this is something that isn't discussed enough, but uh, it needs to be. And Mm -hmm. and I am encouraged by the fact that both Trump and Vance, along with Robert Kennedy, have been focusing on it. I am still stunned and blown away by the fact that in this last year, America has become a net importer of food. It's one thing that's always (laughs) been one of our strengths, that we, we have the space and the land and the agriculture infrastructure to grow our own food, to raise our own livestock, to not rely Mm. on foreign countries for the nourishment of our people. We fed the world, not the other way around. Vance hit it head on. Take a listen. Cut 30 here, Michael. I'm a fourth generation farmer. In fact, we sell our produce right across the street here at the Eastern Market. Um, How will your administration, after seeing what we went through after COVID and the important um, respect to domestic food production, help the American farmer to survive the increasing inflationary costs of doing business and global competition? Yeah, well, thanks for the question, Robert. And, you know, one thing you probably know, Robert, because you're a farmer, but a lot of people don't realize, and this is maybe the scariest statistic of the last few years, is that America just last year became a net importer of food. What that means is that we grow 
less food than our people consume, which makes us reliant on other people for the very food that we feed our children. I think that's very, very dangerous. And part of the reason is because we've made it so hard on our farmers. Now, they're, they're, when I talk to farmers, and you know, Ohio, I represent the state of Ohio. Don't hold it against me, Michigan. But uh, I talk to a lot of farmers in the state of Ohio because we've got a lot of them. I know Michigan has, has a lot of farmers too. You know, one of the things that I hear is that between natural gas prices, because natural gas is a big part of the fertilizer that farmers use, um, between diesel costs, between gasoline costs, the cost of energy has made it really, really hard for our, for our farmers to actually do what they do and grow the food that we need. So we got to bring down energy costs to make it more affordable for farmers to do what they do. The other thing is that we got to make sure that foreign competitors aren't flooding our markets with cheap agricultural products that destroy. Thank you that destroy the wages and the livelihoods of farmers. But again, it makes us more reliant on countries that ultimately don't like us. This is something we gotta be very, very worried about. What we learned, you mentioned this, I think, Chris, during COVID, is that we became so dependent on foreign countries for the supply chains, right? We couldn't get like hospital masks and hospital gowns in the midst of a pandemic because China made a lot of that stuff. Well, if we're worried about manufactured goods, how much worse is it to rely on other countries for the very food that we provide to our families right. Right. We've got to go yes. in the other direction and cut down on agricultural dumping. One of the ways you do this, and this is a big difference between President Trump and Kamala Harris, is Kamala Harris has really criticized the idea of using tariffs. President Trump has said rightfully, in my view, obviously I'm a little biased, but that unless you're willing to use tariffs to go after countries that are manipulating our own markets, whether it's food, energy, or manufactured goods, you're going to be giving up on American productive workers. We can't do that. We've got to protect our farms, protect protect our manufacturers, make more of our own stuff, grow more of our own food. And that's fundamentally the President Trump approach to these things. People all the time, Patrice, say, I wish yeah. our presidential elections were about really important ideas, big policies mm -hmm. and bold initiatives and, mm -hmm. and have it be intelligent to, that respects the voters' intelligence. That's exactly yeah. what we got here. That's exactly oh. what we got with J.D. <laughs> Vance. It's, it really I, is great. I feel like I just ate a, a delicious heaping plate of substantive delicious food um, because it's, it, President Trump speaks in big picture um, sound bites, which is great for what he does. But when he says drill, baby, drill, there's a reason why he's saying that. And that's where yeah. paired with J J.D. Vance breaking down how the cost of energy is making it more expensive to the fertilizer, to ship yeah. your goods, all of those things. So I, I, I love it. It was I great. It's great. It. And it's an important issue that needs to, by the way real fast cut 31 yeah. um uh, they actually took a phone call question too it wasn't Ooh. just the live people at the town okay. hall here listen so senator you're going to want to sit down for this one. Oh no not unlike beetlejuice if you invoke the former president's names too many times in a row oh, no. he's going to want to weigh in on what is being said <laughs> about him and we have a call right now from former president donald john trump he wants to weigh in Mr. President, I know there's a little bit of a delay. Can you hear us? And what is your question for the senator? Well, I can hear you, Chris. And I do have a question, and I think it'll be quite an interesting one. The answer should be easy. How brilliant is Donald J. Trump? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there you go. So it wasn't just a deep dive into policy. Yeah, we also had yeah. some fun. This was a guy. If you guys have a chance, go ahead and grab this video and watch it. It was good stuff. Now on 105.9 FM and streaming worldwide on the WMAL app. O'Connor and Company. It's 836 now, Patrice Anwuka, and uh, things are getting... Yes. Are you are you pumped? Are you feeling... I know they're trying to fatigue us with all the news and all of the throwing all this garbage at us right before the election, but you don't seem to be. You look like you're still ready to fight. I've got my Sylvester Stallone punching in the air you energy fact, right you're, now, Larry. You're, you're kinda, you're kinda it's a fry right and I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm pumped. Well, so is Jamie Brennan. Jamie Brennan heads the Moms for Liberty <laughs> chapter in Frederick County and is uh, taking that organization uh, and the organizational skills that she learned through Moms of Liberty uh, right to the Frederick County School Board. She's running the website is brennanforboard.com. Jamie, uh, what a journey this has been. How's the how's the election going? Thanks, Larry. Thanks for having me. Um, um, nice to talk to you, Patrice. So I, it's good. Um, we had really good voter turnout yesterday. 
Mm. Uh, we feel really excited about where things are going. Um, the Democrats are put out a hit piece about me and, and several other conservative candidates in the state. I, I saw, so, I saw know, this. That feels I got, good. I, I, I got to tell everybody, this is great, because usually, you know, a political party will say, here are our uh, our recommendations for you. Yeah. They put out little voter assistance cards. Here's mm-hmm. who we're endorsing. Maryland Democrats went out of their way to put together a list of people that they're recommending uh, you vote against, which is so typical of Maryland Democrats. It's like they're not for anything, but they know what they're against. And you made the cut. Everybody needs to vote against J.B. Brennan. What a badge of honor. It is. Look, they even put my picture at the bottom of their little flyer. So, I mean, I really have a fan club. That's well, amazing. This, so, Jamie, tell us about, you know, what your key issue seems to be education, a lot of education reform, um, promoting school, school choice, expanding, you know, technical education. You know, talk to us about what are the key issues that you're hearing after you've ta- knocked on so many doors. What of those really resonates most with voters? So what's really resonating most is obviously the lack of education proficiency in our county. Um, We hover around 50-ish percent or lower across most grade levels. And a lot of parents don't know that unless their Mm. children happen to be one of the kids struggling. So that's a huge issue. Um, Definitely having educational options is a big issue. We talk to parents. They're not happy with their districted school and would like Mm -hmm. to do something else. They feel like the leadership in the school is not working for them, you know, um, things like that. And so they would like the other options. Um, And honestly, when we talk to parents about what is actually, you know, like the sex ed curriculum that's in our schools, you know, a lot of the parents, unfortunately, you know, we're all busy, we have busy lives. And a lot of us just don't necessarily see what's going on in the day to day basis until their child, you know, encounters it themselves. Wow. I I got to say, I, most parents probably have just sort of figured out what's been going on in our schools. And when they saw during COVID and afterwards what the priority was for the curriculum and the focus and what they, they were spending all this time on, they probably were like, oh, no wonder my kid struggles with reading. No, mon- no wonder the statistics in our state mm. are so underperforming with regard to math. It really is that fundamental, isn't it, that so much energy is, is spent and so much money is spent on the woke garbage that there's no time or money left for the basics. Hmm. Oh, my gosh, absolutely. And, um, you know, we talked a couple weeks ago about that base camp thing. And I finally got my PIA uh, public information request back, and they redacted the amount that they paid for that ridiculous program's website app thing, you know what I mean? And because as Mm. a trade secret, you know, this is the kind of things they waste our money on, and then they hide it. And they, you know, these are the things they're introducing in our classrooms, and then they waste our money on it. And we're not investing in tried and true quality curriculum for our children, you know, Mm -hmm. back to the basics kind of stuff. And that's what parents want. Overwhelmingly, that's what I hear parents want. And, of course, Mm. they don't want any of the other stuff. You know what I mean? They don't want boys in the girls' locker rooms. We have a policy that already allows that in Frederick County. Um, You know, they don't want any of this kind of stuff. They want their children to learn how to read, write, and do math. Well, yeah. picking up on that last thread there, um, the, the big issue that at Independent Women's Forum, where I work um, full time, it is about keeping girl sports for girls, keeping we, female sports for biological females. And is that one of the issues? It, it's surprising when I talk to many women who are surprised, know about the issue and are surprised and are motivated by it. Do you feel that same motivation? Yeah, absolutely. We had people out at the polls yesterday that they would, you know, come by and and we would say, hey, do you know about this policy? Do you know that we allow boys on girls' sports teams? And people are shocked, and they say, well, no way. You know, I don't want to vote for that. And we say, okay, well, the Apple ballot candidates, the flyer you just picked up, those people all support that. Hmm. So, yeah, it is a huge motivating issue, and it crosses party lines. Remind everybody, uh, Jamie Brennan, quickly in our, in our final conversation here before Election Day, uh, what you need, uh, how people can support you, where they need to go to support you, and why this is so critical right now for Frederick County, because this feels like a tipping point 
Uh, everyone moved to Frederick or grew up in Frederick because they didn't want to be Montgomery County. And, uh, well, that dream may be fading if Frederick can't turn things around. Tell us tell us again how to get, get you across the finish line. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, yes, BrennanForBoard.com is my website. Please, we could absolutely still use donation support. We could really use help at polls. We have 62 polls to cover. Um, mm. So if anybody is motivated and can help, that would be fantastic. Um, and then also please consider supporting the other like-minded candidates, Colt Black, and write in for Heather Fletcher because it would be fantastic to get all three of us across the finish line. That'd be mm. Great. All right, you radical extremists, get back out there and <laughs> pound the pavement, work the sidewalks. Great talking with you, Jamie. All the best, Jamie. Oh, thanks, guys. Talk to you later. And, you know, I really do appreciate the Maryland Democrats putting out this little card, you know, who to vote against, because uh, now I just take it to the polling place. I do the He's opposite. Go, okay, uh, exactly. That's go right. down the it's list. Like super helpful. <laughs> Thanks for your waste of money. It's 843. Weeknights with Mark Levin, 6 to 9 p.m. On News Talk 105.9 WMAL, making sense of the news. Patrice, uh, one of those hilarious, spontaneous, unexpected campaign trail moments happened yesterday with President Uh Donald Trump. He's working Nevada. He's in Las Vegas. He goes to a Cuban restaurant. He's shaking (laughs) hands. Uh And then he turns around and standing right behind him is Donald Trump. Well, a one of those life-size cardboard cutout pictures of Donald Trump that you can pose and take a oh, picture yes, with. Oh, yes, 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 yes. But somebody put, like, a giant Mexican sombrero on it <laughs> and a blanket. <laughs> and, well, this is what the crowd did when he walked into the restaurant and hung out with his uh, doppelganger there. Listen. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Listen to that. Listen to that crowd. Like, we love you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it's amazing. And uh, listen, the, the Latino vote is moving strongly for mm-hmm. him. But I, 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 you've seen those life-size Donald Trumps, and it's just pretty. It's just hilarious to see it with a uh, sombrero, and he just stood there and posed with it. <laughs> <laughs> so people it's got like, a which picture is the with real Trump. Trumps. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. He should have put the hat on himself, but it would have messed up his hair. Listen, Kamala Harris wishes she could do this. At best, she could stop at a what a Seven Eleven, and and yeah. they have to do eight takes of them pretending to find her some Doritos that she that she refuses to eat on camera anyway. No, ah. this is this is authentic. This is regular people who who love this man. Um, you can't get better. You can't make this up. You can't script it like they tried the Harris. Listen, it's uh, it's Friday. We're heading into the weekend, and then uh, by the, when we reconvene Monday morning, we will uh-huh. be basically eight days from election day. Oof, I want to give you a, qu- a quick roundup here from Real Clear Politics. First of all, brand new New York Times Siena poll on the mm-hmm. on the national uh, uh, poll numbers okay. just came out, and it shows Trump and Harris in a tie. Wow. And and that actually moves the real clear politics average for the national number to a tie. Mm-hmm. Now, we don't elect presidents with a national number, but let me just no. tell you, if you're a Democrat, you need that number to be Democrats plus two at least mm-hmm. right now. And it's a tie. Let's look at the three most important states. Are you ready? I'm going to throw some numbers yes. at you, but these yes. are important. Pennsylvania. Right now, Trump is up on the average by six tenths of one percent. Four years ago, Biden was up by 4.8 percent. Clinton was up eight years ago by 5.2 percent. Wow. Trump is be- and the final tally in, uh, of course, Trump won eight years ago. Four years ago, Biden was declared the victor by mm-hmm. a little over one percentage point. Uh, moving on, though, to uh, to uh, uh, Wisconsin, excuse me. Um, hang on. Wisconsin, Trump is up by two tenths of one percent. Four years ago, Biden was up by five and a half percent. Clinton, eight years ago, was up by six percent. Whoa. Trump is now up by two tenths of a percent. And of course, eight years ago, Trump won. Four years ago, Biden won by a frag about eight tenths of one percent. And finally, Michigan. Michigan right now shows Trump up two tenths of one percent. Four years ago, Biden was up nine points. Whoa. Eight years ago, Clinton was up 10 points in Michigan, hmm. this close to the election. Trump ended up winning eight years ago. Four years ago, Biden was declared the winner. 
by two percentage points. Trump is poised better than he ever has been in these battleground states this close to the election. There's your roundup. There we That's go. fantastic. It's 852. It is. That's a wrap, Patrice. You have a great weekend. You too, Larry. It's going to be a great weekend because I'm going to start it by listening to Christopher Q. Plant. That's Chris? me. <laughs> QAnon. A QAnon plant. Christopher Q. Anon. Oh, I, I wasn't going to go there. Yikes. But, yeah. I Googled you, you this morning. I Googled you this morning, and I, I saw that your, <laughs> your profile has been updated, and that is uh, that's yeah. fascinating. I, you've hung, that's around, something. Yeah, we, hung around Hollywood too much, I think. When you funny. Google my name, there for some reason you get a picture of Harvey Weinstein, and I, I am complaining <laughs> to management about that. Management, you should uh, you should get a team of lawyers and sue them for $100 million. <laughs> Or that. I don't know. They might settle for like, uh, you know, seven or eight million. That could be fine.